to be known as the 9mm gunman, has several teams of detectives trying to hunt him down. During the course of the first incident, which was a sex crime, he identified him during the conversation, he identified himself as Kevin. Brooklyn detectives say that a woman who was sexually attacked in a Crown Heights apartment building has become a key witness. She was attacked, say police, on August 12th, just minutes before the gunman shot his first two victims in the basement apartment of the building well known to cops as a hangout for crack addicts. The subject was distracted when the two shooting victims arrived shortly thereafter and entered 1616 President Street, enabling the victim to escape. In fact, detectives believe that the gunman was in that building because he's a crack addict, hunting down money for his habit. We believe that his motive was robbery. The 9mm guns, which can hold up to 16 rounds in a clip, have long since been the weapon of choice for many criminals, most of whom steal their weapons or buy them from illegal gun traffickers. I'd say in the last 10 years, the 9mm has been uh, increasing in uh, usage. Now, once again, police tell us that they have arrested a man in this case and have suspected his name is Kevin. He's being questioned at this hour. And police also tell us that they have recovered a 9mm gun. Channel 2 News will follow this story and have more at 11 o'clock. Reporting live from the 77 in Brooklyn, I'm Lisa Castleman. Now back to the studio. Lisa. The countdown to class now stands at 16 days and counting. And dozens of parents got their first chance today to go face to face with New York City officials over the asbestos scandal. And those in charge of the asbestos cleanup have just wrapped up a news conference to update their progress. Correspondent Reggie Harris joins us live now from Queens with the latest on this. Reg. Well, Jim, the School Construction Authority is promising to inspect as many as 35 schools a day now that it has scoured the country and brought trained certified asbestos inspectors from far and wide. Now, those inspectors working in two-person teams are the key to getting this job done with just two and a half weeks left before school opens and more than 700 schools yet to be inspected. I'm pleased to announce that the number of inspection teams has risen to 52 at 9 a.m. this morning from 28 on Friday. More is still being added, and we anticipate that 76 teams will be in function by Wednesday. Asbestos inspectors from as far as Kansas and Atlanta are now in New York City schools searching for loose airborne asbestos that is potentially hazardous. This afternoon, officials of the School Construction Authority again assured New Yorkers that all schools will be inspected by the time schools open. What we're saying today is, is that we believe that every school will be inspected by September 9th. We cannot and we will not say that all schools can open until we know the extent of asbestos in the schools. I am concerned about the health of all our children. Parents had a chance to put their asbestos questions to school officials and medical professionals today at an information forum on Staten Island. The parents went into the session skeptical about how well the crisis can be handled with so little time to the first day of school. They came out with the same skepticism. The direct um, implications to the health may not be that serious. However, and there's a big however, we don't know. And the SCA officials say they know they have a credibility problem. They want to prove to the public they say that they are doing the right job. Now, the status report at this point, 356 schools are in some stage of the process, either actively being inspective, actively being cleaned up, being retested or already completed their retesting. There are still 713 schools, 713 yet to be inspected. Jim, Tony. Reggie, uh, under the circumstances, they had to get these people out there, the inspectors, uh, quickly. Some people might be wondering if they're qualified, if they're up to snuff, if they can handle the job. Well, we certainly asked that question also, and we were told that they all have federal licenses and their credentials are being gone through individually. They're not taking bulk uh, groups of inspectors and assuming that they have uh, the right training. Of course, the uh, company EnviroSafe, there was a problem last week with some of those inspectors having, some of the old inspectors having been trained by an affiliate of the company that's uh, caused the problem here. Uh, the people who are coming in definitely have, we're told, the proper training. And they have a big job on their hands. Thank you, Reggie, for your report. 
New York City police officer was charged today with murdering a woman found dead in his home. Police claimed that off-duty officer Michael Garcia used his service revolver to shoot and kill a 28-year-old woman in his home in Bensonhurst. Garcia has been a cop for three years. He is also charged with criminal possession of a controlled substance believed to be cocaine. In Detroit, two former cops were convicted today of murdering black motorist Malice Green in a case that some have compared to the beating of Rodney King. Two separate juries convicted former officers Larry Nevers and Walter Budson of second-degree murder. The two were accused of using heavy metal flashlights to beat Green to death last November. They could get life in prison when they're sentenced next month. A third former officer, Robert Lessow, was acquitted of assault. Jim? And still with the courtroom, testimony is already focusing on race in the case of two black men charged with beating a white truck driver during the Los Angeles rioting. Damian Williams and Henry Watson are accused of brutally attacking Reginald no Denny and seven others during the outrage following the first Rodney so King verdict. Today, during the first day of testimony, one of those alleged victims said she saw black men stopping cars on the street and allowing only black drivers to pass. Prosecutors are also expected to focus on the videotape of Denny's beating, which was broadcast on television live. In Florida today, a jury selection is underway for the second time in the trial of two white men accused of torching a black tourist from Brooklyn. Mark Kohut and Charles Rourke are charged with the attempted murder, kidnapping, and the robbery of Christopher Wilson. Police say the Tampa laborers used racial slurs while dousing Wilson with gasoline, then setting him on fire on New Year's Eve 1992. The trial was moved to West Palm Beach after attempts to seat a jury in Tampa were unsuccessful. Jim? Coming up next on Channel 2 News, why one town is not big enough for them both. People in one neighborhood bear their anger and an all-nude club now searching for a new home. And charges that some questionable strings may have been pulled to keep the U.S. Open tennis tournament in New York. That story coming up. Channel 2 News is sponsored by your Tri-State Jeep and Eagle dealers. Mayor Dinkins must be uh, thinking things can only get better. Just days after a new scandal shook the Parking Violations Bureau, there are new questions now about a deal the city cut, supposedly, to keep the United States Open Tennis Tournament in Queens. Correspondent Marsha Kramer joins us live now from City Hall with more details. Marsha. Well, Jim, these have been tough times for Mayor Dinkins. First, there was the Crown Heights report, then the asbestos scandal in the schools, and then the Parking Violations Bureau scandal. And now tonight, here at a city council hearing, new questions are being raised about whether the city gave away the store to keep the United States Tennis Association Stadium in Flushing Meadow, Queens. Well, I believe that there are a lot of elements here that would lead anyone to come to the conclusion that it's a sweetheart deal. What Councilman McCaffrey was referring to was the latest questionable call in Mayor Dinkins' quest for a straight-set victory in November over Republican liberal challenger Rudy Giuliani. New questions about a deal crafted by the city to keep the United States Tennis Association, which runs the U.S. Open, from packing up its rackets and leaving New York. We want to keep the USTA in New York. But we're not going to give away the entire store to be able to do that. While local residents who live near the tennis stadium in Flushing Meadow protested outside City Hall today, the City Council prepared to hold a hearing on the contract. It would allow the USTA to go ahead with a $172 million expansion on 35 acres of parkland. Among the items being questioned are decisions by the city to forgo a $3.6 million fee for brokering the deal to agree to accept the same rent for the first 25 years of the 99-year lease, which critics say would cost the city about $11 million, and an agreement to pay the USTA $325,000 in fines if too many planes fly overhead during the tournament. Can the city control how many planes fly over the USTA tournament? Uh, we have not as of yet purchased any surface-to-air missiles to knock planes out of the sky. No, we have no control over that. And if that wasn't enough for critics to get their teeth into, two of the people at the center of the deal are also at the center of the Parking Violations Bureau scandal. First Deputy Mayor Norman Steisel and his Chief of Staff, Ellen Baer. I'm not saying that Norman Steisel does anything wrong, but it seems that every time there's an ethical question that arises in City's call, he's uh, right there in the middle of it. City officials defended the deal. We think that the public benefits in this facility, we think compared to any other sports deal in the country, this is the single best 
and I ask you to go out and find a better one. We can demonstrate that this is perhaps the best deal for a municipal stadium in the nation, certainly in recent times, and that just is a fact. Well, the actual vote on the contract won't happen until sometime next month. But one sign about how important this deal is to the Dinkins administration is that the first deputy mayor himself, Norman Steisel, is scheduled to testify here sometime tonight. Reporting live from City Hall, I'm Marcia Kramer. And now back to the studio. Thank you, Marcia. We should know tomorrow if Larry Hogue will be headed out of New York City for Connecticut. A court is expected to decide tomorrow if the so-called wild man of 96th Street can be released from a psychiatric hospital in Queens and go live with his son in Bridgeport. Hoag's received treatment for nine months after harassing people on the Upper West Side for years. Jim? Coming up next, some changes you should know about if you take the train to work. And then Frank Field will tell us if our weather is going to change for better or for worse as the week wears on. His forecast coming up next. The Lincoln Mercury. If you take the Metro North Railroad's Harlem line, there are some scheduled changes in your future. Workers will be replacing 25,000 railroad ties on the Harlem line between Hartsdale and Crestwood from September the 8th to October the 3rd. So if you'll be riding the Harlem line during these dates, we suggest you pick up a new timetable at Metro North ticket offices. Make some adjustments. Isn't life a series of adjustments? You have a minute and 45 seconds, sir. I'm gone. <laughs> we do have some uh, very warm and humid and sticky weather that's moving this way. Uh, so enjoy this evening and tonight because by midweek period, things will change dramatically. Today's high temperature, that was 86 degrees, and right now it is 78. Uh, the humidity has been inching up. It's now 65%. Uh, the wind is generally out of the south to southeast, so there's a little moisture that's creeping in. But what is happening now is that the dry air mass, that nice, comfortable airflow that dominated the area through the weekend and into today, is now beginning to shift off into the Atlantic and replacing it now is a very humid air mass that's pushing through. And the leading edge of that warm air is developing some cloudiness. You can see the clouds streaming up in our direction. Uh, those clouds will start moving in later tonight and tomorrow. And then tomorrow morning, clouds will be overhead. Then the sun will come out and burn that off. So for tonight, partly cloudy later tonight with temperatures getting down into the upper 60s here in town, the lower 60s in the suburban areas, still quite comfortable. The humidity will begin to climb tomorrow, and tomorrow morning we'll start out with a temperature of about 71 degrees, variably cloudy during the morning hours, and then the clouds will begin to part, more sunshine during the afternoon, and as we warm up, temperatures again will reach up into the 80s. But the important factor is that more moisture will become in the air, and that means more humid weather beginning late tomorrow. The possibility maybe of a few widely scattered showers developing during the midweek period as another weather system works through. So this nice, delightfully dry weather that uh, has dominated through the weekend and into today is giving way, and more humid weather will develop the rest of the week. And this, I guess, would be a nice week to have as vacation, Ernie. Yes, it would be, wouldn't it? <clears throat> yes, it would, but you've already right had now. yours. I've had mine. What about you? I'm gone. <laughs> I don't get one. <laughs> a combination of sun and song drew dozens of youngsters to the Upper West Side today for free concert. That garbage grows and grows and grows. Garbage is supposed to decompose. The words go. Tom Chapin garbage brought his message to be kind to the environment to the Lincoln Center today for its free summer concert series. Songs by the brother of folk singer Harry Chapin brought many smiles to many small faces. All I right. Feel sorry for you. <laughs> Vacation time. Well, the smiles have turned to anger, actually, in one Long Island community. Up next, why what's been going on behind the doors of this club was enough for dozens of people to show up in a courtroom today. That story's coming up. Some mountains are over 500 million years old. And while water still covers over two-thirds of them, the rest. There's only one Jeep, and it's only at your Tri-State Jeep and Eagle dealers. A lot of people have tried to figure out what makes Bush's baked beans taste so darn good. Roll that beautiful bean footage. Some think it's our specially cured bacon, our fine brown sugar, or our delicate blend of spices. But the secret's right here. 
the Bush family recipe. No one outside the family knows this recipe, and I can guarantee you, it'll stay that way. Bush's baked beans. The great taste is no secret. In original, onion, vegetarian, and home style. Hi, I'm Jim Palmer for The Money Store. Even if your credit is less than perfect, you can still refinance your first mortgage at today's low fixed rates. That's because The Money Store looks at your total credit picture and won't automatically disqualify you for late payments. At The Money Store, you can apply by phone and there's no application fee. So if you want to refinance at today's low rates, even if your credit isn't perfect, call 1-800-LOAN-YES. The Money Store, where America goes for money. Looking for a great inspired Oprah to shed those extra pounds yet again. The Secrets of the Incredible Shrinking Oprah on Hard Copy, tonight at 7. We're back now with more news for you. The club that's already been kicked out of Queens isn't exactly finding going any friendlier further out on Long Island. Neighbors aren't rolling out the welcome mat for Runway 69's brand all-new entertainment. Our Channel 2 reporter, Vic Miles, has the story. Runway 69 has come to Island Park, but if many of the residents have their say, it'll be gone before long. The all-nude bar comes compliments of the same management that ran a similar place in Queens for a short time until a series of large protests by residents there forced the club to move out. This Island Park club was open less than three weeks before the town shut it down, claiming various code violations. Now the club is in court fighting to reopen. The case, scheduled to be heard today, was postponed, but a lot of the pros and cons of the bare butt antics in Runway 69 were argued on the steps of the courthouse in Mineola. Well, whether people like it or not, that's not the issue. If they have the right to do it, they should be permitted to do it, and that this type of entertainment is lawful. This case is different, however, in that they had no building, uh, they had uh, eight summonses served on them for violations for building codes, right through the ordinances, right through the zoning. So as in Queens, Runway 69 could be run out of town again, this time by organized opposition from the Island Park community. We don't want it, and our community is making a statement to every other community. If you don't want it, get it out. No doubt, Runway 69's all new dancing has some Island Park residents in an uproar. But there are at least three other nightclubs in the immediate vicinity that although they don't have all new dancing, residents claim they attract so much wrongdoing that Runway 69 now just takes the issue another step too far. The kids do all kinds of things. They jump out of their cars, they urinate on the lawns, they throw bricks through your window. Still not hard. absolutely everyone wants to see the club go. I think I like it. It's like great, it. yeah. Take it into the city where it belongs, not out here. I just don't think they belong here. They belong in the city somewhere. This is a Manhattan club. Runway 69's already thought of that. There is one in the Times Square area. As for Island Park, a state judge gets the final say there next Tuesday in the Mineola Courthouse. Mick Miles, Channel 2 News. Take a look now at some of the stories we're working on for Channel 2 News at 11. Tony Guide is in the newsroom, right? All right, Jim, thank you. And coming up tonight at 11, the latest in the case of the so-called 9mm madman. A man is now in custody being questioned in connection with a series of shootings in Brooklyn. We will bring you the latest details. Also, did Lee Harvey Oswald work alone? CIA and the FBI finally opened their secret files on the assassination of JFK. We'll have details on that, too, coming up tonight at 11. Back to you. Thanks, Tony. Coming up tonight, Channel 2 News at 6, D-Day for the Giants. A man once known as the touchdown maker found out today he won't even make the team. He's not alone. Bruce Beck, next with sports. The party is the talk of the town. Hey, Dale, how you dip them? Rock Lobster. How you love them? You don't need Oh, you have fun just using your hands. New combinations like you've never had before, all at special prices. The lobster's just the best at Red Lobster's Lobster Fest. The party's over in a few weeks, so don't miss it. Red Lobster's Lobster Fest. A champion, we have the best trained employees and loan officers in the business. They'll put you at ease and take the time to walk you through the second mortgage process step by step. And they'll show you how to replace those high interest credit card debts and other bills with one low monthly payment. And they'll show you how a home equity loan from Champion can save you hundreds of dollars a month. Just call 1-800-CHAMPION and let them show you the kind of respect and concern you deserve. When your bank says no, Champion says yes.
Channel 2 Sports Report, sponsored by your Tri-State Cadillac dealers. When the New York Stock Exchange goes into action tomorrow morning, they'll be looking for stocks with high upside potential and little downside risk. And the same goes for leasing an automobile. Lease the sophisticated 93 Cadillac Eldorado, only $4.69 a month on a 24-month lease with a $2,193 down payment. Talk to your Cadillac Tri-Statesman soon. The essence of smart trading is knowing when to act. Mr. All Beck, right. better go deep. I have the speed, Jim. <laughs> Say goodbye to Stephen Baker, the touchdown maker. Today, the football giants waved the wide receiver who has been the team leader in average yards per catch in each of his six NFL seasons. The arrival of free agents Mark Jackson and Mike Sherrard and the fact he missed all of the team's off-season workout programs spelled doom for Baker. In 1987 third-round draft choice, Baker made his biggest catch as a giant in Super Bowl 25. A 15-yard reception from Jeff Hostetler in the club's victory over the Buffalo Bills. In all, Baker caught 141 passes for the Big Blue, scored 21 touchdowns, and averaged 18.3 yards per catch. When Baker gave this football to a fan in a wheelchair, it was not surprising. He was that kind of guy. Still, he was sent packing by the Giants brass today. We felt like we got some people a little bit better, and, uh, and I think that was basically because of... Uh, uh, a lot had to do with being familiar with the system and him coming in here late. There were a lot of guys that were ahead of him and uh, you know you hate to see those things happen. There's no doubt. I mean he didn't have to prove anything. He can play in the league but you know hopefully for our sake we're making the right decision. One other football note locally is the Jets acquired Seattle wide receiver David Daniels for an undisclosed draft choice. Daniels caught nine passes in two years with the Seahawks to baseball and the American League pennant race. The Yankees begin a three-game set tonight against the White Sox in Chicago, the first part of an important seven-game road trip. Hopefully we can uh, be a little more successful on this road trip than we have been in the past couple. I know we haven't played as well as we'd like to on the road, so, uh, and, but we've played Chicago awful tough this year, so hopefully it's going to be a good trip for us. Now we're going into Chicago, and there you go. Chicago's playing for something, too, and uh, we got a, another tough series, and uh, that's what, what we're concentrating on. The Yanks hope past success bodes well for the upcoming series. The Bombers have taken five out of six from the White Sox this year. New York looks to snap back from yesterday's drubbing at the hands of the Kansas City Royals. It was a ball game which was over early. Mike McFarland's solo homer in the second started the avalanche, and KC went on to bomb Melito Perez and the Yanks 7-0. While the Yanks begin the night one game behind Toronto, the Mets open a series at Shea with Cincinnati with the knowledge that they are clearly the worst team in baseball. The proof the came this weekend in Denver. The Mets were swept by those expansion guys, the Colorado Rockies. Household name, Freddie Benavides, sent the Mets on a long flight home after this solo homer in the seventh, his second game-winning hit in as many nights as the Mets stay on target to lose 100 ball games this season. The men's tennis tour is at the Wolbaum's Hamlet Cup this week in Comac, New York. Today, Alexander Volkov, Sergey Bruguera were first-round winners. Red Hot American Michael Chang plays his first match tomorrow, but yesterday he was in Central Park in New York City conducting a free tennis clinic for 300 area youngsters. Chang loves playing New York and is looking forward to the U.S. Open. I met my, my, uh, my first big splash on the Pro Tour uh, at the U.S. Open as an amateur. And uh, for me, that was very, very exciting. Um, you know, I think that um, coming here is always very special. You know, I think that last year was a, a, a darn good year for me. Uh, at the U.S. Open, and you know, I'm hopefully uh, looking to uh, improve on that this year. U.S. Open tennis special coming up Saturday night, 7.30, right here on Channel 2. Ernie? Very good. Thanks, Bruce. They're going to miss Baker. That's Channel 2 News at 6 for this Monday. I'm Jim Jensen. And I'm Ernie Anastas. I'll see you again tonight at 11. Stay tuned now for the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather and Connie Chung. Have a good night. <laughs>